Welcome to the Women and Wealth podcast with Esther Sabo. Esther is a respected leader in the field of personal financial advice with over 25 years of experience. After going through her own significant and challenging life-changing events, she overcame fear and self-doubt to launch her own successful advisory firm. Now Esther is ready to share her practical and personal experiences to help other women clear their hurdles and brave life's transitions. In this way, she inspires women to lead fulfilling and confident lives. Hello and welcome to Women in Wealth with Esther Sabo from Gates Pass Advisors. Esther, how are you today? I'm great, Eric, except you shocked me before we started recording, saying how it was snowing where uh, you are. It's, and on top of that, yeah. those winds. Yeah, the, the, we, I, the wind warning came last night and it said until 6 p.m. today, it's going to be 50 and 60 mile an hour winds. And which, again, wow. not so bad, except for that it's cold and snowing. And I'm just like, I'm so glad I'm inside right now. That's all there is to it. I, I, I'm not walking out there. I'm not getting the mail today. Nothing. I'm, I'm, I'm going to wait till it warms up, which could be April. So There could be a great circular that you're missing. There could, yeah. You could miss the Bed Bath & Beyond coupon. Yeah, that, that envelope full of 100 coupons I never use. I don't know what that is. The, right. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So anyway, that's what it's like here. I know that you actually have Eric Shea on the line today with you, and you guys are doing a podcast together, so that's what's going on there, but what are you guys talking about? Well, we are talking about employee benefits, and actually, even deeper than that, this is, this kind of wraps up a, a, a trifecta of podcasts on protection, protection mm. of assets through property and casualty insurance that we did with Dairy Wisdom, as well as through valuables, art, sculpture, etc. that mm -hmm. we did with Andrea Roth. And now with Eric, it's also self-protection. And it happens to coincide with this period of open enrollment with employers. And we're talking about how those benefits can come in handy. But sometimes, <clears throat> for whatever reason, somebody doesn't have an employer and how do we handle it? So mm. I am so happy to have Eric, my uh, co-pilot here on the podcast as well. So Eric, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. And Eric, this is like your third time on the podcast. This is, this is I, becoming, a, becoming a regular thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm a seasoned pro. That's right. So <laughs> this, is, this is good. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you're here. I'm I'm eager to learn what you guys are talking about. And and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is actually part of a webinar as well, correct? Yes, yes, it is. I actually just uh, just had a webinar earlier this week where we were talking about maximizing your employee benefits that that you get through your uh, your open enrollment, mm -hmm. and just you know where where are the most underutilized overlooked areas that can really help save you or, or make you some money and uh, and better your financial picture. And so we just kind of walk through the top five, 10 areas where you can really make make a difference in your financial plan. All right. I'm here to learn with the rest of the audience. Eric, teach me. Well, I'm going to launch off with a question for Eric. Uh, Eric, your uh, if you can start with uh, just a little bit about the particular niche that you focus on within the practice of Gates Pass Advisors. Yeah, absolutely. I I work with successful professionals and and high earning families who uh, whose lives are just becoming more complicated. They're they're moving out of the period in their life where they could just kind of put their head down and focus on themselves and their career, and they're coming into real money responsibilities. Whether that's uh, joining lives with uh, with getting married or bringing kids into the world or buying first second houses, trying to decide if if one spouse could stay home in in any case. Case, there are some big decisions to be made and some some big transitions to plan for and I just I really help people understand the options and tools available and and how to use those tools to, to meet their financial goals well can you describe some cases we often work together on cases where we have uncovered a need for a client through planning or through some of your own cases that you've done independently that where they need some insurance protection and how that was addressed. Absolutely. Well, so the the whole purpose of life insurance or disability insurance is really about protecting your income. Um, and so whenever there's a need, whenever there's somebody who relies on you financially, you need to protect that economic interest if for some reason something were to happen where 
unfortunately you're not there tomorrow or you can no longer work and and you can't collect that paycheck and so it's it's not just about replacing you know 10 years of your salary if uh, if you were to die tomorrow it's um it's about finding customized solutions for your specific situation. We have one situation with a with an older woman who's uh, who's a handful of years away from retirement, and she's on her second marriage. Her her spouse doesn't actually work, and she's really uh, supporting the entire family. They they hold their assets separately. So if she were to pass, everything were to will will go to her children. But she doesn't want to leave her spouse hanging high and dry. There's still a mortgage on the house. She wants to at least be able to ensure that she's able to uh, to keep the home for him. So in that particular case, we we pulled out a term life insurance policy for the value of the mortgage at the time. So if something were to happen, her spouse would still have a place to a, a home <laughs> to, to to live mm-hmm. in and and and. Um, and that was enough for her. Uh, we have uh, another situation where we have a single guy in his 40s making a great living, nobody really depending on him. So there, there's not really a need right now that, to, to protect that income for somebody. But he does have plans to get married and build a family. And the unfortunate thing about insurance is that the, the, older, the older you get, the more expensive the insurance gets. And so quite often, even though somebody doesn't have the the economic need right now, will suggest buying a policy preemptively so that you lock in those better rates and you don't run the chance of something happening in your life where you may not qualify or the premiums would be forced to go up. Eric, one of the things with that, I believe um, that is an employed gentleman. Is that correct? That's correct. And so is there a reason... Uh, why not just use the insurance that's available through his employer? Abs- absolutely, there there is. Um, so yes, he. A, a lot of people get life insurance through their employer. Typically, there's at least some sort of basic life insurance that could be uh, lower premiums. Typically, like twenty five thousand, uh, a twenty five thousand dollar policy, or ranging to some lower multiple of your salary, which is good. You, I would say never turn down free insurance from your employer. Um, the The issue with uh, with the em- employer it based insurance is that it's uh, there's no portability, and and what that means is that if you leave your job tomorrow, next week, next year, whatever insurance you had through the company goes away. And so you would be forced to go find another another policy. And so that may come from your new employer. But if not, if you were to go out and find find a new policy in, in the private space, that insurance policy will be um, will be that much more expensive because now you're uh, you're not doing getting your your insurance through a group plan and you're however many years older which means unfortunately means you're that many years closer to dying and the insurance companies (laughs) jack up the premiums they're so cold (laughs) (laughs) and then the other thing is um can it be possible that an employee, like you talked about portability, where they could take the coverage with them? I believe it can be possible at times, but as you said, the group rate no longer goes, so it can be quite a bit more expensive. Is that correct? Exactly. So yeah, in in the particular cases where where you can take whatever policy you have through the company with you and just take over the responsibility for those premiums, you you no longer have the the negotiated quote, discount rate through that the group received um, through the company. And so the premiums will be, uh, premiums and costs to you would be significantly higher. Got it. So those are some examples of life insurance that, that uh, recent cases. What about disability insurance? Absolutely. Any anybody who's who's working and relying on their income should have some form of of disability insurance, long term disability insurance. And so, if if you're again to turn around tomorrow and and can't work for a couple of days, you know that's great. You you probably have some emergency savings. You could take some some PTO at work. But what happens if you can't work for several weeks into months, potentially years? Um, that's that's what 
long-term disability is for. And so really, we, we actually probably find more, case, more cases of need for disability insurance than we do mm-hmm. the life insurance. Like we have one case, um, a, a self-employed woman who's, uh, who has the financial assets to take care of her children were she to pass. There's no, no need for, for life insurance. But if she were to turn around tomorrow and not be able to work for a couple of years, they, they would be in, in in some pretty dire straits. And so that's where we we recommend the the long-term disability to come in. And so you'll pay an annual premium and that long-term disability would give you a benefit if something were to happen that it pays a, a percentage of your your annual income. And usually for for private plans you can pay to get, you know, 60 to to 70% income uh replacement from the policy and along with that uh, oftentimes they'll come with a uh, with what's called a writer or an additional benefit where the uh, the the income has a a cost of living increase over time as well so as long as you're as as you receive that benefit it would increase with some level of inflation so Eric were these you know, this situation with the client's disability, was that possible to be addressed through an employer plan? Absolutely. Really, most employer uh, benefits, when when you're given your your HR packet and listing all the benefits, really a lot of employers offer some, again, basic disability insurance that will come to you at no cost or or really very, very little cost. Uh, Again, they'll... uh, the the benefit won't necessarily be typically be as high as a private policy, but you'll get fifty to sixty percent of your income uh, replaced through the benefit. Most generally don't include cost of living writers, or um, and and they work very well. Again, never turn down free free or uh, appropriately low cost insurance. Uh, it, it's a good place to start to to pick it up. But there are some downsides to the uh, to the uh, corporate sponsored disability insurance. Number hmm. one, it sounds uh, it sounds really good. Why? What what downsides <laughs> could there be? We love so, free or low cost things. Yeah, exactly. But uh, again, like with the uh, with the life insurance, it's it's rarely portable. You can you can rarely hold on to it if you were to leave the company. So then you'd have to go out and and get qualified for a new policy and likely have higher premiums than uh, than you would have gotten two, three, four years ago. And then as well, there there's the issue with the benefits uh, being taxable. So when your employer pays any portion of your uh, your premiums for the long term disability, the benefit you receive since since those payments are for your benefit prior to taxes, the benefit you receive is then taxable income. So that's different from a private policy. If you were to go out and, and get yourself insured and pay the premiums on your own, or even in the cases where you pay the premiums, the, the full premium in your offering, those benefits are actually tax free. So there's a huge wow. benefit to paying your own premiums for the disability insurance. It's it's really interesting because over the years, uh, disability insurance, it can be somewhat expensive, right? Or how it can feel quite expensive each year. Yeah, absolutely. It, um, it ranges really kind of on average, I've seen somewhere near, I would say around 3% of your, your annual income. Um, that floats obviously by the policy and, and the different benefits that you're, you're, um, you're looking for, but I mean, it's not, um, it's, it's not a small number. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And so that that's a nice way to put it. I like putting it in the percent. Uh, but, but when you change that to say, oh, my goodness, I could have, and this has happened in the practice where people would contact me and go, oh, I don't want to pay this premium. It comes mm-hmm. up and it's like, you know, we just don't know what will happen. And it's, I've certainly had cases where it needed, it was absolutely needed for years mm-hmm. and what it paid versus what they paid in was quite staggering of course nobody like i've said this before in the podcast i kind of hate insurance because you don't want to pay for something you hope you won't use but my goodness having all of that tax-free income it is very hard to get that in today's interest rate environment from portfolio assets 
Would you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, and that's the thing about insurance and it's just an inherent in, in the tool (laughs) that, you know, you're, you're, you're insuring against low probability events. And so, but the, the downside and the risk that you're taking with those low probability events is really catastrophic. So you're, you're just, it, it's not fun to, to pay these premiums for something that is so unlikely to happen. But what's, what's worse is to not be insured and have that unlikely event mm-hmm. actually occur. And then you're in a spot where you're, um, you've bottomed out and um, you're in a, in a very, very tough spot. Yeah. And just briefly, we're not going to talk extensively today about long-term care insurance, if at all, but could you explain, because this is often misunderstood, I think you agree, what's the difference between long-term care versus long-term disability insurance? Absolutely. So long-term disability insurance, like, like I said before, is really, it's insuring your paycheck. That's, it's insuring your income. Whereas long-term care insurance isn't necessarily based off of your income, but you're insuring against the cost of care if something were to happen to you. So you're, you're insuring against the cost or, or the expenses that come along with somebody helping you with your day-to-day living. Mm-hmm. For clients, just go to shift gears a little bit here. For clients with employee options, employer-based options, given it is right now when this comes out, it's in the middle for most of employee benefit season to, to review current benefits and confirm they're still the right ones and what other options are available. What are some perhaps overlooked areas that you've found? Absolutely. And it's, you know, everybody is aware that you, you get your, your health insurance options and you can either go with a typically a, a PPO or an HMO. Um, some plans that have kind of been been more popular in in the recent past, just given the rise in in the cost of healthcare, have been high deductible health plans that can actually be both PPOs or HMOs. But really, the the advantage there is that you have a, have lower premiums up front, but are expected to to cover a higher portion of the costs that actually occur. Um, but it, so that keeps the upfront payments down and, and the cash is pretty easy on the cash flow, assuming that you don't have a, a large medical events that year. Um, so, I mean, if a quick side note, when you're deciding on your own, which type of plan to take, you know, if you take a look at your expenses from the last year and um, you know, they're, they're relatively low and you don't expect any anticipated procedures. A high deductible health plan could be good for you that year. Uh, if your, your health is a little all over the place and you have a couple of kids, a couple of boys that enjoy rough housing and, and jumping on each other. <laughs> and Sounds you like might personal take a few, experience here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I might be, I might be having some sort of flashback here, but you know, you take a couple of trips to the emergency room, things like that, where you have some higher costs, you know, it, it, it may not be the best option. So in choosing your, your, your own plan, there, there's not one solution fits all. But I will say that if you do have a high deductible health plan, taking full advantage of the HSA option, which is a health savings account, um, it's, it's a pre-tax uh, account where you can set money aside to pay for medical expenses that are if the if the benefits are used for qualified expenses that you know trips to the doctor uh, medical procedures uh, uh, prescription drugs and so on uh, those those distributions are actually tax free so the the health savings account you're you're basically kind of getting you're paying for your medical you're getting a sale on your medical expenses because you're not paying taxes on that on the income that you would usually pay used to pay to to pay uh, to cover other expenses. So let's look at that a little bit more. So what you're saying is a high deductible health plan has the high deductible. So that means that more comes out of pocket, but they'll come with this health savings account where 
that gets funded in some way with money that then you can use those expenses. Is that yes. right? Yes, absolutely. So it gets funded. Um, it, it can get funded in a couple of ways. The number one, the, the primary way is directly out of your paycheck. It'll, they'll debit a certain amount out of your paycheck every, every cycle whether that's uh, bi-weekly, monthly, wh- however that happens, they'll, they'll take a certain amount out. And that money, like your 401k contributions, is not taxable. So you're, you're not paying, that lowers your taxable income. Uh, and then as well, a, a number of employers will actually make a contribution to the HSA as well to maybe, um, and in a number of cases, we'll see the, uh, the company contribute enough to cover the, uh, the, deductible for the plan so that it, it's just another added benefit for uh, for the employee so those those assets get contributed and actually there's there is an annual limit that you can contribute which for individuals in 2022 that limit is going to be three thousand six hundred fifty dollars and if you have a, a family plan you can contribute up to seven thousand three hundred dollars And I know there's another type of plan, the FSA. And before we get into that, or maybe as you do, do you have to empty out that HSA each year? So that's another great benefit with the HSA is that no, you there's no time limit on when you need to use the funds. And in fact, if, if you don't use the funds, most HSAs come along with an option that you can you can invest the the assets that are in that health savings account so that they can actually uh, you can leverage the growth of those funds through uh, typically a set of some mutual fund offerings in there that so that the money can be working for you while in the account you're not using it and it can grow tax tax free so uh, that's so so nice (laughs) <laughs> it, it really is. It, it's very nice. And so, uh, and actually a fun fact about HSA accounts is that if you turn, so as I mentioned, HSA distributions are tax-free if you use the distribution to pay for medical expenses. If you turn to, if you turn 65, you can actually effectively treat your HSA as an IRA. So prior to 59, prior to 65, if you take out uh, a distribution from your HSA, say that's not a qualified expense you have to pay income tax on it and you get a charged a 20 percent penalty but after age 65 if you take a distribution that's not a medical expense out of your hsa you just have to pay the income on that there's the penalty goes away after after 65 and and that's why eric and i get excited about these things these are financial <laughs> planner nerd things but they're just great ways to use different tools that are available yeah there's adjustments right when people start using these it is different having a high deductible plan and paying more copays etc but it does open up a bit more flexibility for future doesn't it it really does it really does and so the uh the prolonged life of the assets in in an HSA, like I said, is a very strong benefit that only comes along with an HSA. You previously, you mentioned an FSA, which is a flexible spending account. Uh, There there are a couple of different types of FSAs available, uh, but one that is kind of most similar to an HSA is the medical FSA. And it's, it's different in a sense that uh, you can, you can have, one without having a high deductible health plan, but you don't actually own the account. The account is owned by the employer. And so it's connected to your employment through the employer. You still make contributions to the FSA through your your paycheck. Those are pre-tax and any uh, qualified expenses that that you use the distributions for are tax-free. But Another big difference is that you do have to actually use all of the all of the money in the account every year. So any any money that you've contributed to an FSA that doesn't get spent by the end of the year goes away. <laughs> And so, mm-hmm. and, and you start refilling again the next year. So that's really the, the big difference. Um, as well, the, uh, the amount that you can contribute is, is lower as well. For an FSA, the most you can contribute next year is going to be $2,850, which, as you can tell, is significantly less than the, the 
thirty-six fifty for an individual or even seventy three hundred for, for a family. So it requires pre planning of to what one thinks they'll spend in a year with the FSA, right? Exactly. You have to put a little more brain power into into thinking, okay, where how much how much am I gonna spend on this stuff? And so again, it looks it you, you take a look at back at your last year or year or two that to say how much did I spend on prescriptions, what kind of preventative health appointments have I had and, and all that sort of those fun things. <laughs> Well, great, Eric. Thank you so much for giving us a review of some of these kind of overlooked areas of employee benefits and also critical areas to look for your own personal safety nets. If somebody wanted to review your recent webinar and learn a bit more, how would they be able to do that? Absolutely. I uh, one you could reach out di- to me directly, and I could forward a copy. <laughs> uh, my email address is just Eric at GatesPassAdvisors dot com, or as well, we'll have a copy up on our website under the uh, the Education and Resources. Very good. And I know that when you just spoke about FSA and how important it is to have an idea of your spending, I will just remind listeners of episodes 62 and 63 of the podcast, which are on the website, which is all about gaining clarity around your spending with Allison Salisbury to listen to those because these are things where you go, gosh, have no clue what we spent the past couple of years. If you've got a good way to monitor your expenses and budgeting, it's very, very quick to make that uh, decision about your contribution so you don't end up losing some and that you're well set for the upcoming year. So Eric, thank you so much for sharing some of this with us. Thank you for being a great co-pilot on client work. And with that, Mr. Eric Johnson, I will turn this back to you. All right. Well, I just want to echo what Esther said. Eric, thank you so much. A lot of great information, and I know that there's a a ton of people that are going to gain so much knowledge out of this podcast, and hopefully they're uh, looking you up, say, hey, look, I just need to review some things, Uh, because again, uh, what Esther's always said is, you know, the more clarity you have, the better decisions you can make, and I think that that's uh, very, very important for everyone. So, Eric, thank you so much for doing this. Esther, of course, thank you so much for bringing Eric on the podcast. It's always a pleasure. Absolutely. It was great for me, too. And thank you. You bet. And our last thank you is always reserved for you, the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Women in Wealth podcast with Esther Sabo. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Esther comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it really easy to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thanks so much for listening today. For everyone at Gates Pass Advisors, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Women and Wealth podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you receive notifications of new podcasts as they become available. Check out the website at www.gatespassadvisors.com for more information. This content is developed from sources believed to be providing accurate information. The information in this material is not intended as tax or legal advice. Please consult legal or tax professionals for specific information regarding your individual situation. The opinions expressed and material provided are for general information and should not be considered a solicitation for the purchase or sale of any security. 